Got it. Um, like Randy yeah. said, I work in Middleburg, Virginia at a place called a place to be a private arts based therapy practice and I'm going to get a lot into that later on in my presentation. I work with a range of individuals. I have children who have developmental disabilities, who have ADHD, then I have teenagers and adolescents um, who might be on the spectrum and then I work with some adults and some of them are neurotypical and some of them have depression, anxiety, etc. So I want to go over first um, the format of this presentation because I'm trying to squeeze a lot of information into a pretty short amount of time today. So my outline is, I'm going to start with part one, what is music therapy? It's a fair question and I get it a lot. Um, music therapy is not going into a place and entertaining people and playing live for people, but we're going to get more into that. Then part two, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and my personal clinical experience, how I got into music therapy and how fun and music can be a motivator for learning. Um, then I'm going to go into part three, which is music in the brain, why the interaction of music in the brain is relevant for intellectuals with developmental disabilities. And then part four is specific music interventions, and hopefully this is going to be the fun part of the presentation where I get people up here volunteering. You don't have to sing if you don't want to, but I promise it'll be pretty fun. Okay, so part one, what is music therapy? According to the Comprehensive Guide of Music Therapy, which is what all music therapists are required to read, um, music therapy is a systematic process of interventions wherein the therapist helps the client to promote health using music experiences and the relationships that develop through them as dynamic forces of change. So that's just a lot of words. It's kind of hard to understand. I wanted to break it down for you really quickly and tell you what, I, what that means. So music therapy is systematic in that it's goal-directed, it's organized, it's knowledge-based, it's research-based in many cases, and it's regulated. So we're not just gonna go into a psychiatric setting or a hospital setting and just randomly start working with somebody. We have specific inter interventions um, for each client. It's individualized and it's based on our clients. Wherein the therapist helps the client. So a music therapist must have the necessary expertise to provide service. You can't just be like Taylor Swift going into a hospital. That's not necessarily music therapy. Um, and we have to have recognition by an appropriate authority which for us is the American Music Therapy Association and then a degree from a university. So a lot of music therapists start with their Bachelor of Arts, but many of us go on to get our master's degrees. So we're not coming in and doing music to entertain people. We're clinical practitioners who focus on the individuals that we serve to promote health. So health encompasses and depends on an individual, their relationships, their culture, and their environment. Each session is tailored to um, the particular client depending on their needs or diagnosis. So let's say we have a six-year-old boy with Down syndrome. Maybe his goals are to improve speech and to help him regulate his emotions. What we would do is we would tailor our session to the goals of that particular child, and we would use interventions that a lot of times are research or knowledge-based to help him to reach those goals. Okay. Using music experiences. So as music therapists, we do rely on music as an agent of change. It's not the only thing that we use, but it is important. And we do this through a variety of ways. One would be improvising. And what improvising means is, let's say, um, I'm going to play a chord on the guitar. And I, if my client is nonverbal, I want him to respond maybe on the drum by playing something in response. But we're playing something new in the moment. Then we have recreating, which is taking a song that you've heard on the radio and maybe playing it live, um, or having the client engage in playing it live and engage in learning. Then we have composing. A lot of my clients will express themselves through songwriting. Um, and then we have listening, which is just maybe listening to live music for something like relaxation, guided relaxation, or just listening to one of your favorite songs because you want to share it. Um, and this is with or without verbal discourse, depending on the needs of each client. So the relationships formed through them, this is important. The relationship between the client and the therapist is essential. Um, and although I'm going to share with you interventions that can be used cross-disciplinary, um, you can't call those interventions music therapy unless they are practiced by a board-certified music therapist. As dynamic forces of change, so there's three necessary elements in music therapy, and that is the client, the therapist, and the music. And I should say the relationship between all of them, too. 
Um, yeah, and like I said before, there's these activities can be helpful in a variety of settings, but they're not considered music therapy unless I am a music therapist. So a lot of people get this confused. Um, they might see on the news that a nurse brought in a playlist for um, somebody in a geriatric setting who has dementia, and that person started speaking. Now, if the nurse isn't a music therapist, it's not technically a music therapy. It's using music as therapy, but it's not music therapy. And then music therapists work with many diverse populations of individuals. So I have peers who will work in hospice settings, palliative care, psychiatric settings. I have people working in schools with people with developmental disabilities. And then I, in particular, work in private practice um, with mainly adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Okay, now I wanna jump into a little bit about me. Um, so, let's see here. So, how did I get into music therapy? It all started when I was a little girl. My father was waiting for the bus on the corner of our street for his morning commute to New York City when the driver of a sprinter van fell asleep at the wheel and hit my father on the sidewalk. About a week later, my father woke up in his hospital bed unable to speak, walk, or remember who I was or who my two sisters were. He was suffering from a traumatic brain injury. My father was quickly moved into Kessler Rehabilitation Center where he underwent intensive therapy. He eventually began to regain his speech but suffered from aphasia um, and would say things that would make my sisters and I giggle. So for example, my aunt got a haircut and my dad really wanted to be encouraging so she walks to the door and he goes, nice rug! So, <laughs> so he would say he would get words confused a lot. So if we, were, if we left like an item of clothing or slippers on the floor, he'd be like, get the bunnies, get the bunnies off the floor. So it was kind of funny, um, but he couldn't really speak well, very well, but I have very early memories of him singing his heart out. So my mother would be downstairs and she taught Bradley Ruth Method classes. I don't know if anybody's familiar with those. She would teach them downstairs and my dad would be taking care of us upstairs. And although he couldn't really give us instructions on what to do, he would turn on songs like Thunder Road by Bruce Springsteen, and he would just sing every word. So um, eventually, with a lot of hard work, my dad was able to really regain his speech um, and his gait, so he was able to walk and talk. And he eventually went on to earn his educational doctorate from Montclair State University. It took him a really long time, but he had the capacity to do it, and he did it. So he is now a self-advocate. Um, he's won numerous awards for his work at Montclair State University. And to this day, my very musical family believes, because my family is incredibly musical, Irish Catholic family of singers, we believe that music and singing played a crucial role in his recovery. And I'm gonna, gonna get more into the science behind that eventually. But I didn't know the science at this point, so. When I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Music and Philosophy, I immediately started working in the inner city um, schools in Philly, teaching music to high school students. I also worked as a direct care worker with a nonverbal child with Down syndrome. He had experienced neglect and he was very small for his age, he was very skinny. And when I first met him, he would sit in the corner of his room and he would just sort of like sway back and forth and stiff because he did not know how to interact socially. So um, I decided to use my musical gifts in my work with him. So I would bring my guitar in on working days and I would sing to him. And eventually he started working over at me. And when I found out what his favorite song was, which was This Old Man, he started laughing hysterically. Eventually um, through this interaction, through this musical interaction, he started coming over and he would sit on my lap and he would look into my eyes and smile at me. And then eventually, um, I mean, during this time, I started uh, getting the research publications for the music therapy journals, and I, my interest really climbed. I saw that music was being used clinically and it was being used successfully. Um, so I started trying to teach him sign language through music, and it actually started to work. So he started to come out of his shell, and I would go to school with him every day. Um, he started to come out of his shell, his sense of humor started coming out. He started interacting socially with people. Um, and he quickly became, I think, the most popular kid in school. I mean, people would 
call his name in the hallway and run up to him and give him a high five. And I think it was partially because he was so cute. But also, he was coming out of his shell, he was engaging with people, he was becoming social, and he was realizing that it could be fun. Um, so, I really liked that, and I started to realize that the combination of fun interaction, music, treating somebody as though they are a unique human individual is extremely powerful, and that's when I decided to move on to my master's in music therapy. Um, one of my favorite things that I've done as a music therapy as a music therapist is worked with a group called the Joy Bells. Oh, here's my dad, by the way. Here's my dad getting his doctorate. And this is the Joy Bells. So here we are playing um, at the World Meeting of Families for Pope Francis in 2015. Now, you may notice that most of these individuals are adults and they have Down syndrome. So they play the bells and they do it really, really well. It's not just like humoring them. They actually are musicians. And the way in which they do this is through visual cues like sign language. So the sign language worked with the individual that I had worked with before. Now, with the bell choir, um, does anybody play piano in here? Anybody? So you might know. So with piano, um, you have your left hand, which is usually playing chords, and then you have your right hand, which is usually playing the melody. So I am the one with the short hair, and I'm playing the left hand and I'm directing them with signs. And then my co-director is playing the right hand, which is usually like the melodic part. And we point at them, we give them chord numbers, we give them signs, et cetera. Um, and we do this because there have been some studies that have shown that individuals with Down syndrome have specific visual memory strengths. So they actually memorize these signs, they associate them with the bells that they're playing, and they memorize songs. And the crazy thing is, is that they don't stay in the same position when they're playing. They'll play in different keys, which as a musician, if, if anybody knows what that means, that's really difficult to do. So those are the joy bells. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of what they do. They're really neat. Special boots. Yeah, So now I work at a place to be, which is a really unique place. It's art-based. We have a drama therapist there. We have a, an arts therapist. Most of us are music therapists. And again, we recently won the award uh, from the American <coughs> Music Therapy Association for best practice in the United States. So I work with some pretty talented um, therapists. But it's unique in that we get our individuals out in the community um, and we get them advocating for themselves through performance and through music, if we find it therapeutically appropriate. Um, so what happens at a place to be, we have contracts with hospitals, we have contracts with uh, vocational day programs where we're bringing in adults who are working, who are trying to work in the community. 
and they come in to a program called Lunch Bunch, where um, they engage in social interaction with neurotypical volunteers, and they'll have a big music experience where they're learning social skills, and then we'll have lunch together, so it's really fun. And then we have a group called Immersion, which is a group of typically older adolescents who are in high school, and they may be on the spectrum. Uh, we have one individual who has Down syndrome, and they come in for a, a full day intensive music therapy session where they're learning music, they're learning musical skills, but they're also learning social skills, they're learning emotional regulation, etc. And then I have individual sessions. Um, and I'm going to show you a little commercial so you have an idea of what a place to be is. So I'm going to start with communication and then get more into the brain. So communication begins with a sensory perception. In order for you to react to me, you must first hear or see me. You must then make sense of what you are hearing and or seeing. And then you must create an appropriate response based on your understanding of your perception. And in order to do this, your brain must be able to organize itself appropriately. Um, so according to brain imaging studies, the normally developing brain typically Re uh, registers visual perceptions in the right hemisphere of the brain. So when you're watching me, when you're watching my body language, what I'm saying, my hands moving a lot, um, you're registering that typically on the right hemisphere of your brain. 
Now, when you register auditory perceptions, which is like the tone, or the inflection of somebody's voice, or the words that they're saying, you typically register that on the left side of your brain. So here's a little visual for you. And you'll see that there are auditory cortexes on both sides of the brain, but language and understanding speech is typically, again, on the left side of the brain, where your Broca's and your Vernicus area are. And you have the visual things. Okay, so I have a question for you. Where do you think music is perceived in the brain? Does anybody have any guesses? <laughs> okay, good. Why? So you, you hear it, but then you have to process it, and then you access memory, and so it's a lot of emotional content. So the frontal lobe will be your, your temporal lobes, even. Amygdala. Yeah. Okay, so you guys know that's awesome. A lot of people are like floored when they hear that it accesses multiple areas of the brain at once. You're exactly right. So you have the corpus callosum, which is organizing the information and passing it between the hemispheres. You have, let's see, I have to look, because I don't know as well as you. Um, you have keeping a beat or clapping or tapping with your toe, which stimulates your motor cortex. You have instrument playing and dancing, which will activate your tactile sensory cortex. You have musical memories, again, the hippocampus. You have the expectation of the next beat, so if you can clap on beat, um, that's going to activate your, uh, where does it activate? Your prefrontal cortex. Um, and then the emotions associated activating the cerebellum, the amygdaloid, etc. Um, okay, so now I want you to imagine that you're singing in the shower and you're remembering the songs to that really catchy, you're remembering the lyrics to that really catchy song you've heard on the radio. Where do you think the lyrics to that song will be activated in your brain? Or will be perceived by your brain? Any guesses? Okay. Any other guesses? Okay, I see a version of that. Okay, so on, so lyrics to songs are actually perceived in the right side of the brain, whereas speech is perceived on the left side of the brain. So melody combined with language is actually perceived on the opposite hemisphere of the brain than is typical for language, and this is relevant. Uh, because when you look at somebody with autism spectrum disorder, with Down syndrome, there are differences in how they perceive things. So, for example, it's been shown that there's more right brain activity in individuals on the autism spectrum during auditory and speech perception, which is atypical and implies a, sensory, a difference in sensory perception. And then you have abnormally functioning mirror neurons. And if you don't know what mirror neurons are, they're they fire when, say you and I are having a conversation and you're reading my body language, you're kind of mimicking my body language and we're responding to one another in a way that's considered socially appropriate. My, your, your mirror neurons and my mirror neurons are, are firing. But maybe somebody with autism doesn't have those mirror neurons firing appropriately. So then you have Down syndrome and there, the brain synapses are enlarged, which can oftentimes lead to learning and memory impairment. Then they have verbal memory deficits, and what I mean by that is um, they may not have an understanding of what specific words mean. So for example, when I work, I, I work with a group of 50 individuals with Down syndrome um, at a place called Melmark, and oftentimes they would come up to me and they would say, Katie, can I ask you a question? And I'd be like, sure, what do you want to know? And they would tell me something. So, and this would happen across the board with my individuals where they're misunderstanding what it means to ask a question. Maybe they thought it was, I just want to tell you something. I just have something fun to share. Um, then there's been shown that they have visual spatial memory strengths. And this is based on a study where um, they took some neurotypical children and they took some children with Down syndrome. And does anybody know the game Simon where you're memorizing the patterns? You're following the, the light patterns? So they would have uh, each individual memorize uh, a series of visual patterns on blocks. There were colored blocks. They would have them tap out the blocks. And the children with Down syndrome actually scored higher than the neurotypical children in um, getting the appropriate pattern on the blocks. So 
there, there has been some studies that have shown that they have visual spatial strengths. And I've had experience where my clients with Down syndrome are, are showing visual spatial strengths with the belts, for example. Uh, for example. Then uh, they have amyloid plaque, which forms in the brain as early as the age of 12. Amyloid plaque is something you probably are familiar with. Um, it can be responsible for the manifestation of the symptoms of dementia. So a lot of them, unfortunately, um, get early onset dementia, so. Okay, so what are the implications? Again, in autism spectrum disorder, differences in sensory perception, it's possible that anxiety and stress exhibited by individuals on the autism spectrum has to do with the disorgani disorganization in sensory perception, which may overwhelm or overstimulate them. So I have a quote from Temple Grandin, if you don't know who she is, she's a huge um, self-advocate for autism. She has autism herself. Um, and she is very verbal, and she is a speaker. And she has said, even today, sudden loud noises, such as a car backfiring, will make me jumpy, and a panicky feeling overwhelms me. Loud pitch noises, such as motorcycle sounds, are still painful to me. So you may see children with autism coming in with those sort of headphones, because they have these sensory sensitivities, oftentimes. Not always, but oftentimes they will. And then there's the dysfunctional mirror neurons, which might make it difficult to, to model movements, so like, if we're dancing, they might have trouble following what I'm doing dancing, but also social behaviors. Then we have Down syndrome. Um, <coughs> individuals with Down syndrome typically have an easier time responding to visual cues or musical cues. Um, and this is based on a study which tested the reaction time of Down syndrome individuals playing a drum. Results showed that when the individuals were shown how to beat the drum, so visual, or they were, um, they heard the sound of the drum, musical. They responded more quickly and accurately than if they were verbally instructed how to beat drum. Now this was a small study, but that's what the study came up with. And then individuals with Down syndrome are especially susceptible to early onset Alzheimer's, which again causes memory loss and other cognitive deficits. So why does music make sense? Okay, so music has been shown to bypass certain deficiencies, and there have actually been, um, studies through neurologic music therapy, which is a branch of music therapy, that have shown that there are really successful ways to engage with an individual, specifically if they have a speech deficiency, and help them to access their speech and eventually start speaking. But it starts with music. So the perception and production of music requires extensive neural connections, thereby interacting with multiple areas of the brain at once, um, and all the sensory domains. We have motor output, so playing certain instruments can be used to reach goals like improving fine motor skills, which might be necessary if an individual wants to work in a vocational setting, and gross motor, motor movement, so like playing a drum. Playing a scale on the piano and learning how to play a scale on the piano might improve fine motor skills, while playing beats on a hand drum can improve, again, gross motor skills or bigger movements. And then steady beat, has been shown to bring about sensory motor organization in most individuals. Um, speech requires a great deal of sensory motor organization. So rhythm can be used to access this in people who have deficiencies in speech or on the left side of their brain, typically. Memory studies have shown that music is strongly connected to the memory. Individuals with Alzheimer's and memory deficits are generally, in, in, in general, have shown improvement in memory functioning after engaging in singing familiar songs. Now, whether this is short-term or long-term, they've only done short-term studies, but we're, we are a developing field, so we're hoping to do more research in that area. Attention, attention, so say I have a child with ADHD or just any individual who's having trouble focusing. Um, studies have shown that using a steady beat while learning certain skills like counting or math, reading or speech can increase um, attention to the task at hand. Lyrics and melody are also, again, perceived on the right side of the brain, um, the part of the brain that registers visual perceptions. So if there are deficits in speech, verbal memory, the right side of the brain has the ability to perceive speech through melody. So because your lyrics are perceived, the lyrics of your songs that you sing are perceived on the right side of the brain, and there's more right brain activity in individuals with autism, in certain cases with Down syndrome, um, they have an easier time singing than actually speaking. So there's this sensor, sensory motor organization that's going on, 
and there's also this ability to access a different part